have him. Can we stand to our feet and let him know how much we love him and appreciate our friend, Ross Johnson. Amen. Love you, Ross. Good morning, Oakland Church. How y'all doing? Y'all doing good? Hey, you can take a seat for a quick sec. The Holy Spirit spoke to me at the 9 a.m. service, and I said, I've been on flights like literally all day yesterday from California. And I said, Lord, I'm not awake. He said, well, guess what? I am. <laughs> And so I want to let you know, I know it's a little bit of a rainy day, maybe you haven't had your coffee, but it's time to wake up because here's the deal. I'm a very passionate and intense guy. I, was, I will promise, I'll try to smile from time to time, but I want to encourage you for the next 30, 40 minutes, would you take this heart posture and saying, God, whatever you want to say to me, say to me. Whatever you want to do in my life, do in my life. I'm here to tell you, I said this earlier, when I preach... I like to preach in a way that puts accountability on us. <laughs> you're either going to hate me, you're going to love me. I hope you love me. Amen. But here's why I do this. I do this because for my story, which I'm going to share here in a sec, I was never in a room like this. I was never around pastors like you have. I was never around leaders like you have. And I wish somebody would have told me, Ross, wake up. Look who you have in front of your life. You see, in our generation, sometimes we show more love and more honor to those who care less about us than those who give us their very own lives. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I'm not just saying this because Pastor brought me in. I called him on the phone. I told him this at midnight last night. I said, Pastor, I get the privilege of traveling America and different nations. This is my favorite church in America. This is the place I love to be. I have been looking forward to being here for the last month or so. One, because you have the best looking pastor in all of America. But second, <laughs> hey man, I, every time I see him, I'm like, are you 45 or 46? I can't tell. <laughs> they both look good, amen. And guess what? When your pastors look good, you look good. So you better shout an amen on that one. <laughs> so like I said, I'm, oh man, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Whew, there's the fullness of what in the presence of God? Joy. So if you don't have a lot of joy, guess what? You probably don't have a lot of the presence. Whew, thank you, Jesus. As a matter of fact, just stand up for a sec. Stand up for a sec. Come on, we're going to do something. Let's do this. I want to prophesy before I preach today. Is that okay? Y'all ready to just hear a word of the Lord? I was flying over here. I said, Lord, I have a message. I love the message, but God, give me a prophetic word for this church, this region, this state. And I heard the Lord speak to me, Psalm 29. And it says, the voice of the Lord echoes above the sea. And then it says, the God of glory thunders. And the Lord spoke to me, he said, son, everybody has a voice, but not everybody has a sound. And I believe here in Oakland Church that God is giving you guys a sound. The sound that brought the Jericho walls down. The sound of worship that causes the enemy to fight against itself. The sound in Acts chapter 2, like a mighty rushing wind that came in and shifted an entire generation. But lastly, the sound that Jesus is going to release when he cracks those heavens and he comes back once again for his church. I want you to know that I firmly believe that here in Oakland Church, God has not just given you a voice, but pastor, he's given you a sound. He's given you a sound in your family. He's given you a sound in your business. He's given you a sound in this region. And I just decree and declare over every single one of you in the building today that your voice would be unlocked to unleash the sound that God has given you for such a time as this. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, you can take a seat. Thank you, Jesus. Whew, you guys okay? You're like, this guy's a little bit crazy. I'm not afraid to be crazy. As a matter of fact, the world is crazy for what they believe, so we might as well be crazy for what we believe. They have no issue saying what they want to say. They have no issue pushing what they want to push. So guess what? I'm going to push the kingdom. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to talk about the supernatural things of God. I am not here for just a cute Christian service. I'm here for the power of God to touch me. God, do me, send me, whatever you want to do. Here I am, God. You see, for me, I'm just going to be real honest. I'm going to share a little bit of my story because when you come to somebody's house, let me say it like this. You ever had a friend come over to your house and they start eating things out of your pantry? You're like, wait a minute, I don't know you like that. <laughs> so before I just come into the house and start eating out of the pantry, <laughs> I'm just going to share a little bit of my story. So for me, you know, it starts on day one. If you were here last time, you probably heard this, but I was born by artificial insemination. I grew up in a lesbian household with two moms. I was raised in the streets of Los Angeles, low income, no father, obviously. And uh, from about zero to 15 years old, life was pretty normal 
to me. <laughs> and I remember at 15 years old, you know, I didn't think I had any issues. You know, I was only 15. I played sports. I had good grades. And, you know, other people's lives looked a little bit different. I had two moms. They didn't have two moms. <laughs> right? My life looked a little different. But for me, it was normal. And I remember 15 years old comes and my friend says, hey, Ross, you want to go to a church service? I'm like, sure, why not? Now, keep in mind, I had never been to church my entire life. Had never heard the Bible, never heard the gospel, never had an ORU worship team singing to me in my room. Zero. And I remember I went to this church service. I'm sitting in the back row. P.S. God loves you if you're in the back row. He's going to get you this morning, let me tell you. And I'm sitting in the back row. And for the first time in my life, I encountered the presence of God. I encountered what we call the Holy Spirit. And I remember going home that night, and I had this thought. And now keep in mind, I had never had a dialogue with God. I had never had a conversation because I didn't even know that was possible. And so I went home, and as I look back on it, that was about 13 years ago. You know what that conversation was? This is what my heart was saying to God in that moment. God, please, please, please. Do not let me be a good person who reads a good book and goes to a good church. God, if you are real, I have to know you. Don't just show yourself to the pastor. Don't just show yourself to the person singing on stage. Don't just show yourself to the small group leader. God, if you're real, show me who you are. And I remember night after night in my room for multiple nights, that presence that I felt in that church building would meet me in my room. And the next time I went to church, I said, Jesus, I want to give you my life. I didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> but I knew he was real and worthy of everything that I had. And I said, Jesus, here's my life. You can do whatever you want with it. And I get born again right there at 15 years old. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, come on, we can clap it up. Thank you, God. Thank you. But this morning, I, I want to be really transparent and really honest with you. I know it's really easy when you look at somebody with a mic to think they had their life all together for every moment of their life. But I'm here to let you know that I've gone through some things. I didn't say things, I said things. And I want you to also know that when you get in the presence of God, anything is possible. I like to say it like this, in the anointing of God, the supernatural is the natural. In the anointing of God, the supernatural is the normal. In the anointing of God, every yoke, what's a yoke? Any heaviness, any depression, any anxiety, any suicide is broken off you. You have a choice this morning, hear me clearly. You have a choice this morning when you walk in rooms like this. The two choices are this. Number one, God, I'm not sure what that is, but I don't want to know what it is. Option number two, God, I'm not sure what that is, but I can't live without it. I am tired of living for myself. I am tired of living the way culture has told me to live. I am tired of living the way the world has told me to live. God, I want everything that you have for me. If you were to say that, I promise you, you won't walk out the building the same way you walked in. If you posture your heart and you posture your spirit, God will touch you and God will save you and God will heal you, I promise. I want to get back into my story for a little bit before I get too off topic. So I get saved at 15 years old. And after that, I graduate high school. I went to college in San Diego. I was pursuing baseball. And I'm just going to be, like I said, really transparent this morning. I graduate college. Nothing traumatic happens. Praise God. I'm super grateful for that. And as I graduate college, I figured out I had to pay this thing called rent. Anybody ever heard of rent before? <laughs> I had to pay this thing called rent. And so this thought hits me. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I have to be a man. I have to figure out how to make money. I have to figure out how to supply for my own needs. Like life, this thing called life is at my front door and I got to figure it out. And so I made a decision in that moment, which was not a wise decision. And in that moment, what I said is I looked at my life and I said, God, I don't have the bank account I want. I don't have the car I want. I don't have the girlfriend I want. I don't have the house I want. I don't have all these things that I want. Notice the word I. And so I said, God, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put you on pause for a sec and I'm going to go figure out my life and then I'll come back to you. Bad decision. And for the next four years, from 2016 to early 2020, I had the worst four years of my life. You know, and here's the crazy thing. In that season, I had what the world told me I was supposed to have. I had the money. I had the business. I had the women. I had it all. But when I laid my head on the pillow at night, I was empty. My soul was broken. And I remember 2020 comes. Y'all remember 2020? You're like, Ross, please do not go there. No, 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 no. I'm going there because it happened once and it's not going to happen again on my watch. And so I want to make sure that us as a church is prepared for what's to come if it is to come. Are you following me? So 2020 comes. 
I start seeing Instagram and Facebook. I'm like, people are literally about to die over a Facebook story. What is going on? I see the tension and the darkness, all the craziness happening. And I wasn't even walking with God at that time. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Ross, if you do not stand now, you never will. Now listen, I love the Father heart of God. I love Abba. But this was not a daddy God type of moment. This was a stern father looking at his son saying, Ross, you have a decision to make today that will impact you not only for today but for the rest of your life. And can I just say this? I believe that in the building this morning, there's some of us where God is saying you have a decision today to make that will not just impact you for today, for this week or this year, but it will impact you for the rest of your life. You know, here's the thing I've learned about God. He's in the business of the long game. He's in the business of not just today, not just tomorrow, not just what you can see in front of you. He's in the business of generations. And I want you to know that I believe what God is doing, what God has spoken to your pastor and how this church has been pursuing the generations this last month. It's not just because we're trying to put a cute Christian conference on. <laughs> it's because God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he cares about generations. And so I want to encourage you. You're like, is this guy ever going to get into the Bible? I promise we will get there. I'm laying the groundwork. I believe God has something significant for every generation in the building today. Does that make sense? Let me finish my story because I forgot to share this in the first service and I was so mad at myself. After 2020 comes and I say, Jesus, I want to give you my life and I surrender. I prayed the most dangerous prayer than any human being could ever pray on the face of the planet. I said, God... Use my life. <laughs> God, send me. Whatever you want to do, God, here am I. Send me. You know what God says? He's like, are you sure about that? Long story short, I met this amazing friend of mine in California who's a worship leader. And we said, you know what? Our governor is telling us we can't go to church. Our governor is telling us we can't sing. Our governor is telling us we can't take communion. Our governor is saying X, Y, and Z. People are saying, Ross, don't get political. I'm like, I'm not getting political. He's in my space. He's trying to enter into the church things. And so here's what we did. We said, you know what we're going to do? We honor our leaders, but we have to honor God before we honor you. And so we showed up at Huntington Beach in California. It's one of the most iconic, famous beaches in all of the Golden State. We showed up. We weren't trying to start a ministry. 300 people showed up. People were getting saved, baptized, delivered off the boardwalk. People were like, Ross, how long have you been a pastor? I'm like, bro, 30 minutes. <laughs> Straight up. Ross, how long you, what church is this? I'm like, bro, I just started going back to church six months ago. <laughs> and long story short, the move of God was on. And for the last three years, I've had this privilege of traveling California doing these outdoor gatherings. Guys, just six, seven months ago, we shut down Hollywood Boulevard. 2,000 Christians showed up on Hollywood Boulevard. It was incredible. 118 documented salvations, 40 baptisms. Guys, we are baptizing people in horse troughs on Hollywood Boulevard. We are baptizing people in front of the Chinese theater, the Walk of Fame in horse troughs. It was wild. People are laid out in the spirit on the Walk of Fame. I'm like, whose star is that? <laughs> the next month, we showed up at Huntington Beach again for our three-year anniversary, and 3,500 Christians showed up. Man, Pastor Dom was there. It was incredible. We had about 90 people saved. There was, the, all, there was literally no room. So many people were getting saved, we didn't have room to walk. Like, it was insane. Why do I share all this? It's not just so you look at me and you're like, Ross, you're a revivalist. Amen. But guess what? So are you. It's not so you look at my life and say, man, that dude's got something special. You know the only difference between my life sometimes and somebody else who's not burning for God? One word, yes. If you would say yes to God, yes to the call, yes to the spirit, yes to the word, God will use your life in ways you can never imagine. You guys okay? Amen. How we feeling? We doing good? Okay, you're like, has he, is that the message? No, that was just the intro, guys. I want to get into the word now. And before I do, I share this in first service. I thought it was really funny, so I'm going to share it again. Please laugh if it's not, okay? So as a preacher, sometimes I get very fired up if you can't tell. <laughs> and I noticed that sometimes when I go to places to share, that after I finished the service, I didn't say everything I wanted to say. And as a preacher, that's like, it kills you. You're like, oh my gosh, I spent hours praying. <laughs> I spent hours in the word and I didn't say what God spoke to me to do. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I had this crazy idea and I decided to buy this thing called an iPad. You guys heard of an iPad? 
And so on this iPad today, I actually have notes because I hate notes when I preach. I just, I just don't like looking at a screen. But I'm just saying all this so you know that if you, look, if you see me looking at the screen, it's not because I forgot. It's because I want to stay on track. <laughs> and I want to make sure that I say everything that the Lord gave me. Amen? Okay, let's transition a little bit to what the Lord spoke to me. I said, Lord, what do you want me to share with this church? What do you want me to share this morning? And he reminded me of this thought that I've been having kind of stirring in my heart, stirring in my spirit. And you know what's interesting about this thought is when I started thinking about it, I was like, oh my gosh, this thought is not only impactful for non-believers, but sometimes it's just as impactful for you and I who call ourselves born-again Christians. You know, we live in a world where truth is, well, they don't even believe in truth anymore. <laughs> and so as Christians, how much more important is it for us to know the truth? Here's the deal. If you and I don't fully know the truth, we won't be able to communicate it to a world that's looking for it. And I heard the Lord speak to me. He said, Ross, many people in their lives, especially as Christians, the reason why they don't see breakthrough, the reason why they're not in healing, the reason why they're in depression and anxiety and suicide and fear and all these things is because of this. They lack a revelation of the humanity of Jesus. I said, Lord, that sounds really good and it'll preach. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> Let me say it like this. Have you ever been going through a situation in your life, a challenging one, maybe you're in one right now, and you start talking to a friend about it. And when you talk to this friend about the situation, you notice that they've actually gone through the same thing. And when you recognize that somebody has gone through something like you, what happens? When you hear that they've overcome it, all of a sudden you have faith. All of a sudden you have hope because what you're going through, they've been through and they've overcome. But think about it on the opposite side. What if you're going through a situation and somebody doesn't fully understand what you're going through? Maybe they've never gone through what you're going through. Can you receive encouragement? Absolutely. Can you receive prayer? I hope so. <laughs> but sometimes there's this subconscious thought that we have, but like, you really don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand what that person said to me. You don't understand the pain. You don't understand the tears. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I think sometimes as a church, we have a subconscious thought like this towards Jesus. We sometimes think that Jesus lived in this cute Christian bubble. That he kind of lived a good life. He didn't really have a ton of things come his way that were difficult. Oh yeah, I mean he died on a cross, but eh. I want to destroy this myth that Jesus lived a cute Christian life. Jesus became the son of suffering. He went through every bit of pain trauma and emotion that you and I could ever experience in our life. Why does this matter? This matters because when trials and challenges and things come your way that don't make sense, if you don't believe that Jesus understands what you're going through or what you've been through, you'll remain in distance from him. Hear me this morning. If we don't see Jesus as not only was he fully God, absolutely, but he was also fully man. If we don't understand or have a revelation of the humanity of Jesus, it's easy for us to distance ourselves from him because we don't think he really understands what we go through. Does that make sense? And I believe that this revelation has to go from a head knowledge to a heart revelation. You see, many people have good concepts and good ideas. They can say the right things. They can quote you the scriptures, amen, but they've never actually experienced it in their life. It is time for the church to go from knowledge into experience. It's time for us to not just talk a big talk, but walk a big walk. It's time for us when people come into our lives and say, I'm dealing with depression, I'm dealing with homosexuality, instead of just saying, hey, you know what, brother, bless you. No, 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 I'm laying hands on you because you're going to get healed right now. Instead of me just saying, hey, I have a headache, let me go pick up some Tylenol, guess what, I'm laying my hands on you. Instead of somebody saying, listen, I can't overcome this addiction, I go, well, guess what, Jesus died on a cross, rose from the dead, sent his spirit, his spirit lives in me, and now his spirit's going to touch you. You see, the difference between knowledge and experience is power. Have you ever met somebody where they talk a big talk, but they never back it up? What do you do? The first time you might be fooled, but the second time you won't be fooled again. And I believe in this hour as the church, we have to go from a knowledge to an experience. When people come in our midst, do they sense the anointing of God? When people come into our midst, do they sense the presence of God? Let's make it personal. When people come to your house, do they get free? <laughs> I hope we have still have friends after this. I promise I love you. I promise I love you. When people talk to you, do they actually encounter Jesus through you? 
When people come to you with a problem, an issue, a situation, do you actually have the power to back it up and to set them free? Do you actually have what this Bible says you have? Do you actually have these words that you've read and that you can say living in you and flowing through you? Friends, revival is not just something that happens outside of us. Revival happens in us and then it's supposed to flow through us. All right, all right, let's get into the Bible here. They're going to they're gonna be like, this guy's too charismatic. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love you guys. All right, go with me to the book of Philippians. I want to read this scripture today. This, there's two scriptures the Lord laid on my heart specifically, and I just want to read some of these. I want to take us on a journey here, and I want to show this live in action in the Bible. So Philippians chapter 2, and just go with me to verse number 5 real quick. This is what it says. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Listen to this. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a what? Human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Verse 9. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor. And gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the, to the glory of God the Father. Man, we love singing that song, right? Every knee will bow. <laughs> every tongue will confess. But friend, before we could ever get to every knee and every tongue, we have to understand what Jesus did. You see, I, I like to think about it like this. Let's go on a journey for a sec. If you've read John chapter 1, you know that Jesus existed in the beginning with the Father. That everything was created through Jesus. And this is the thought that hit me when I started thinking about that. Before Jesus came to this earth, he existed with the Father in heaven. This means that when Jesus, before Jesus came to the earth, he was experiencing the fullness of the glory and presence of God 24-7. Why does that matter? Well, we know if we read that scripture, then when Jesus came to this earth, he was fully God, but he came as a human being. He came fully man. So this means that Jesus left the beauty, the power, the amazing presence and glory of the Father and came to live in our earth that has suffering, that has disease, that has sickness, that has all these things that people go through in life. And what's really interesting is Romans 8 tells us, this is really what blows my mind. Romans 8 tells us, that if we call ourselves a born-again Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in us, it says that we've had a foretaste of this future glory. What's a foretaste? It means a sample. You've had a, a, a little size of it. You haven't had the fullness of it, but you've had a little bit of it. And it says that because we've had a foretaste of this future glory through the Holy Spirit, we groan and we ache as believers for that future day where we can experience the fullness of that glory. Now think of this for a sec. If you and I, as a human being... We have not experienced the fullness of the glory and presence of Jesus like Jesus did when he was with the Father. So that means that if we groan and we ache for the day of that glory, how much more did Jesus groan and ache for that glory when he was on the earth? How much more did it bother him? How much more did he feel this urge and this desire and this longing like, God, all I've known is your perf the perfection of your presence, the perfection of your face, but now I'm here on this earth and it's not like that. What's the point I'm trying to make? Jesus can resonate with every single thing you and I have gone through. He actually decided to not cling to his divine privileges, to not cling to his status as being God, but instead he said, I'm going to become a human being. I'm going to come to this earth and I'm going to live a life just like human beings live. This is crazy, guys. I know if you've been in church for any amount of time, you're like, Ross, this is just simple stuff. No, no, no. We got to understand this for what it really is. God became a man. <laughs> the one who created the heavens and the earth. The one who formed you in your mother's womb. The one who measured off the oceans and measured off the heavens and the skies. The one who knows every grain of sand. The one who knows every thought that you and I have. He became a man. He decided to not just stay in perfection, but to come down to the earth. Thank you, Jesus. I want to share a story. Because... I know many times when people preach, it's like, amen, but like, I want to see practical application of this. Like, what does this really, what can this really do in my life? And the Lord reminded me a few months ago, I was at the gym, 
I love working out at the gym, by the way. Let's bring fitness back to the church. Amen. That's a whole other sermon for another time. And if you go to the gym, there's one thing you'll notice. A couple things you'll notice. Number one, you see the same people over and over, right? Uh, number two, it's not the most spiritual place. <laughs> right? You're just trying to, like, get a, a good bicep pup. All my fellows out there, yes and amen. You know, you're a little bit sweaty. It's just kind of like this place where you're just trying to get in, get your workout, and then go. Right? But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is not trying to get his workout in and go. The Holy Spirit is trying to use you to speak to people. The Holy Spirit has people in that place that you're at and he's saying, hey, check it out. Ross, if you don't open your mouth, this person might not ever hear the gospel ever again for the rest of their life. If you don't open your mouth, Ross, you might be the only Jesus that they ever see, that they ever have a representation of. I know we don't like talking like this, but this is truth. People who do not know Jesus, when they leave this life, they go to hell. Hell is a real place. Hell is not just a bad day, a bad moment, a bad year. No, no, no. It is eternal separation from God and eternal torment. It's a horrible place to go. You and I as Christians have that hope and life and power and authority in, in the spirit in us. We have to share Jesus. I don't want to get off topic because I'm an evangelist. I can preach on that for three hours. But I'm at the gym and I see this guy who I've seen for multiple months. And I go up to him and I said, hey, bro, listen, I don't even remember what I shared with him. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge and I just shared it with him. He didn't text me back. He ghosted me and I was, I was pretty heartbroken. I'm just kidding. But he didn't text me back and I was like, man, God, like, ah, touch this guy. Like, get him. You care for him. You spoke to me for him. Like, would you just encounter him? Two months goes by and I get this text from him. And he texts me out of the blue. I haven't seen him in two months. And he texts me. He says, Ross, I need a new life. I'm like, whoa, praise God. Doesn't get much easier than that. And I said, hey, let's meet up. So we meet up and literally what I'm sharing with you guys this morning, I start sharing the gospel with him and explaining the humanity of Jesus to him. Now remember, at the moment that I was sharing this with him, he wasn't a Christian yet, okay. So he had a, a bit more animated language than what I'm going to say right now. But I shared this revelation of the humanity of Jesus and I'm explaining to him, listen, Jesus understands your pain, man. He understands trauma. He understands the weight of sin being placed upon you. He understands the darkness and this, this grieving that you're feeling in your soul. And when I share this with him, he literally tells me this. He goes, Ross, if I was an effing Christian, I'd be telling everybody about this. I'm like, amen. Amen. You see, what happens is in the world, people who don't know Jesus, when we get the opportunity to share with them, we have to share with clarity, with power, and with the presence of God. And I believe this revelation, amen, I believe this revelation of the humanity of Jesus, once it gets in us, it's going to start flowing out of us. And when people who don't know Jesus hear that he's a real man that understands their pain, their trauma, their emotion, he's not just some religious figure, religious leader that lived a good little life. No, no, no. He is actually fully God and fully man and understands every pain you've gone through. That is a Jesus that the world is longing to meet. That is a Jesus that the world is longing to see. And so I'm just believing that as this revelation hits us more and more, that it would begin to flow out of us. Amen? Okay, go with me to one more scripture. Go with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. This is becoming maybe my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures. It's just really been resonating with me so strongly. And uh, yeah, so Hebrews chapter 2, go with me to verse 9. We're going to read a few verses. The title of this scripture, this passage of scripture is Jesus the man. Come on, somebody. So here's what it says in verse 9. It says, what we do see is Jesus who for a little while was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he, check this out, suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, from whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his what? Suffering, a perfect leader fit to bring them into their salvation. Verse 14. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way 
could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying? Okay, this is, this is powerful. So remember, we got we to backtrack a little bit. Okay, we're going to go Genesis to Revelation in three minutes. Buckle up. Y'all ready? So Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve. I know you've heard this, just stay with me. God creates Adam and Eve, right? It says in Genesis chapter 2 that they walked in the garden with God. Now this is a wild thought. At least to me this is a wild thought. The fullness of God himself and human beings dwelt on the earth at one point with no separation. It's crazy. But what happens? Adam and Eve sin. They disobeyed God. And so there's now this separation between God and man. Why? Not because he hates us, because he's holy. You see, God cannot have a relationship with somebody that is not holy like himself. We fast forward thousands of years, Jesus steps onto the scene. Now here's the thing, when Jesus steps onto the scene, we've been talking about this all morning long, he was fully God and fully man. So when he comes onto the scene, the Bible tells us in, later in the book of Hebrews, he was tempted and tested at every point but without sin. This means that he lived a life in a body like you and I but never sinned, empowered by the Holy Spirit. The life that Jesus lived, if he only did it as fully God, we just clap it up and say, great job, man, I'm, you're God, I'm not. <laughs> But because he was fully God and fully man, empowered by the spirit, if we call ourselves Christians, which means we have that spirit in us, we can now live a life like Jesus lived. You see, this is so, so powerful. And after this happens, we know that Jesus is then hung on a cross, right? And we know that when he's hung on that cross, man, I'm just going to go for it. Real nails go through his hands. Listen, I don't know what a nail going through my hand feels like, but I can tell you this, it doesn't feel good. Real blood came out of his body. The Bible actually says that he was beaten beyond recognition. That means if Jesus was standing in our midst today, you would not be able to recognize him. Jesus didn't just feel some spiritual nails go through some spiritual hands. He had real nails go through his hands. He felt excruciating pain. And why did he do this? He did this because he loves us. He did this because what? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The point I'm trying to make this morning loud and clear is this. You might be in a situation in your life. Maybe you've come out of a situation in your life that's been full of pain, that's been full of betrayal, that's been full of death, that's been full of darkness, whatever you want to put in that box. And sometimes subconsciously, without meaning to, we have this thought process of, God, I know you're good. Jesus, I know you love me. Holy Spirit, I know you live in me. But you don't really understand what I'm going through right now. You don't really understand what that person said to me. You don't really understand how hard that broken marriage was. You don't really understand how hard it was when that person turned their back on me and I gave them my whole life. You see, we have to come into this place if we want to see revival, man, I'm so convinced that God will not pour out revival until the church is whole. Because if he pours out revival on us and we're not whole, we won't know what to do with it. And if we don't know that we're sons and daughters, and instead we operate out of being an orphan or not knowing our identity, when he pours the spirit of God on us, instead of actually filling us, it will break us. You know, Bill Johnson said it like this. If you, have, if you don't have an internal foundation built, the external blessing of God will crush you. It's so vital as Christians that we get whole and healed from all these things I'm sharing this morning. From depression, from anxiety, from loneliness, from fear, from isolation, from anger, from unforgiveness. We have to get free. But here's the deal. The first place that you can get free, actually the only place that it starts to get free, is one, surrendering your life to Jesus. But then number two, it's seeing him at, in his humanity and understanding that he can come close to comfort you, to heal you, and to deliver you from any situation, past, present, or future. Are you guys with me? And I, I, I come this morning because I really like preaching like fiery messages, the glory of God, let's go. But I just felt the Lord really breathing on this and saying, no more will my church, my people look like the world. No more will we have a Christian confession, but our life looks like the kingdom of darkness. Whoa. No more will we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, but our life looks like the devil. No more 
will we say, God, you're so faithful and you're so good, but our life is in shambles. This is not judgment. This is not condemnation. This is not shame. This is simply me telling you that when Jesus died on that cross and rose from the dead, it's not for you to be healed for one day. It's not for you to be healed for one week, for one month, for one year. He wants you to be healed forevermore. Jesus died that we could be whole and healed. I want to point out a few last scriptures before we finish here. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm just going to be honest. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But sometimes even after all of that, you still might be thinking, okay, I get what you're saying, but Jesus, you still don't understand what I've gone through. You don't know my story, God. <laughs> you don't know my pain. You don't know my exact specific situation. I want to show you a few things. I'm not going to read every scripture, but I'm just going to go through them. Matthew 4, Jesus comes onto the scene. He gets taken into the wilderness for 40 nights, 40 days, 40 nights. And it says that he's actually tempted by the devil. But here's the deal. He never sinned. Temptation never got him. But as a matter of fact, he overcame temptation. I want you to know, number one, if you deal with temptation in your life in any single area, any single aspect, empowered by the Holy Spirit, you will not overcome it 70% of the time. You will not overcome it 80% of the time. You will not overcome it 90% of the time. You will overcome it 100% of the time. Come on. Second thing, Matthew 8, Matthew 9, somewhere around there. You guys ever seen The Chosen? I haven't watched it in a while, but there was this scene that I saw a few years ago where the disciples, they're literally arguing about something that's really irrelevant. They're arguing. Jesus walks by them because he'd been ministering all day and night to people, praying, laying hands on the sick. He walks by them and you could tell he's really tired, really kind of just, he needs to rest. And he tells his disciples like, man, you know what, I'm going to go rest in the tent. And they feel really bad because they're like arguing and Jesus was literally praying for people for hours. But the point I, I heard the Lord say in that story in scripture is Jesus also understands what it means to be tired. <laughs> you know, you might not think that's a big deal, but for some people they're like, God, I'm tired. God, life is heavy. I keep doing the same thing over and over. Like, I'm just tired. I want you to know that Jesus understands what it means to work hard. Jesus understands what it means to use his hands. Jesus understands what it means to be in full-time ministry. Jesus understands everything you and I go through. Right? The next one I want to point out. Matthew 9. Criticism. Oh, this is a fun one. <laughs> Jesus is going around, healing the sick, casting out devils, preaching the gospel, doing all these amazing things. And what do the religious leaders do? They say, we're going to plot to kill him. <laughs> Have you ever done things for people? Loved on them, gave them your life, sowed into them, blessed them, just wanted the best for them. But yet no matter how good you were to people, there was always somebody plotting against you. Listen, Jesus, <laughs> if anybody, Jesus understands what it's like to be plotted against. Jesus understands what it's like to be criticized. Jesus understands what it's like for people going behind his back who are supposed to love him. And as a matter of fact, the very people that he gave his life for are the ones that did that. Jesus understands what it's like for people to go behind your back. I want to point out a few more. Matthew 14, death. Yes, this is one that a lot of people sometimes have issues with. If you've lost a loved one, I want you to know Jesus really understands what, you got, what you've gone through. It says that when John the Baptist was beheaded, that Jesus went to a remote place. And I could only imagine that conversation Jesus had with God. I'm sure it wasn't just a nice, good little conversation. I'm sure he was grieving. I'm sure his spirit was a little hurt because somebody who he loved and cared about deeply was gone and he knew he'd never see that person again. If you've had the loss of a loved one in your life, and it's caused grief and pain for weeks, days, years, however long. I want you to know today, this morning, Jesus understands grief. He understands what it's like to lose a loved one. The last few here. <sighs> Betrayal. Yeah, this is a big one. Jesus literally gives his life for three years to the disciples. He gives everything he can give them. He laughs with them. He provides food for them. They see miracles. They see signs. They see wonders. Man, they see everything. And he literally tells them, listen, I am going to be arrested. I'm going to get hung on a cross and I'm going to die. He tells them everything that's going to happen before it happens. 
But as soon as he's arrested, guess what the disciples do? It says that every single one of them deserted him. Have you ever been in a situation where you honored people? Maybe you took care of them. Maybe some of them are in your own family, your best friends. And then at a moment where you needed them the most, they betrayed you. Jesus understands what it's like to be betrayed. Jesus understands what it's like when you're a loyal person, but somebody doesn't honor that loyalty back. Jesus truly understands it. I want to finish here. Luke 19, John 11. It says that when Lazarus dies, Jesus walks into the home. He sees all the people, his family and friends, and they're weeping. And it says that Jesus wept. Think about this for a sec. I know we hear these scriptures a lot, but just think about this. God who became a man actually wept. The living God, the creator wept. If that doesn't prove this point, I don't know what will. Jesus, the son of God understands pain. It actually says a little bit later, right before Jesus was gonna die, he went to the garden of Gethsemane. He had a few of his disciples with him. And it says he was in such agony of spirit that when he cried, there were actually not tears of water, but tears of blood. The point I'm making this morning, and I hope it's just clear as clear as can be. Isaiah 53 says he became the son of suffering, acquainted with the deepest grief, a man of sorrows. I want you to know that Jesus truly understands what you've gone through. It's not just some good Sunday sermon that I'm preaching to you this morning. This actually has the power to set you free. This actually has the power through the Holy Spirit, no matter if it's been two days, two weeks, two months, or 20 years, Jesus is gonna set you free this morning. Would you just stand with me? Just stand real quick. I don't normally do this, but I wanna do this this morning. Would you just close your eyes for a sec? Close your eyes for a sec, just 20 seconds. I want you to take an inventory of your life. What does that mean? God, am I right with you? Jesus, do I know you? If those are yeses, that's awesome. But ask yourself this, am I living in the fullness of victory and healing and destiny that God has placed on my life? Am I free of depression? Am I free of anxiety? Am I free of suicide? And while you have your eyes closed, I wanna break the lie that wants to tell you, will you just deal with it a little bit? There's no a little bit of struggle in the kingdom. There's the fullness of life and power found in Jesus. Just keep your eyes closed for a little bit longer. Please be honest right now with yourself. Forget what your wife or your girlfriend or your friend or your cousin next to you thinks. This is not about you. Sorry, this is not about them. This is about you right now. One day, you're not gonna stand before your, your mom. You're not gonna stand before your wife. You're gonna stand before God. And I truly believe, I saw it in first service, tears people getting free of years and decades of trauma, broken marriages, broken relationships, words that were spoken over people, God was setting them free. And he's gonna do the same thing right now. Go ahead and open your eyes with me. Now listen, when I call people forward, the reason why I have all eyes open is not to point a finger at you and make people look at you and say, oh, you're so bad, you're struggling, no. It's because if you can't make a decision of faith in the house of God, surrounded by amazing Christians in this building with eyes open, you won't make a decision for God outside the building. And I'm not against bowing your head and closing your eyes. I just don't do it because I don't know what the fruit of it has been. So this is how I like to say it. <laughs> with every eye open, with every person able to see, but most importantly, with the Lord able to see. I believe there's at least two groups of people here this morning. Number one, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. Now listen, you can go to church, amen, keep coming to church. You can read the Bible, keep doing that. But the Bible, we back, yeah, we're back. <laughs> the Bible is very clear. If you were willing to believe in your heart, and to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and raised from the dead, guess what? You will be saved. It's a great thing. But here's another thing. Maybe you're tired of living for yourself. 
oh, it's about to get good. Maybe you're tired of living for the world. Maybe you're tired of living for the culture. Maybe you're tired of living for the ways that everybody else and everything else is set to live. And when you lay your head on the pillow, like I said earlier, you're broken, you're empty. It's not satisfying you. Let me tell you a secret. Nothing in this world will satisfy the longings of your heart. No amount of pleasure, no amount of money, no amount of fame. They're not bad things, but they won't satisfy the longing of your heart. Every one of us has a God void. You have a, a space in your heart, and until you know God is your father, you will never be satisfied. So the first group of people this morning, whether you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, or whether you're like, man, I've known him in the past, I've walked away, this thing happened, this thing happened, whatever happened, there is grace for you this morning. God is not looking down at you saying, you're so horrible, you're so bad, you better get up there. No. I say it like this. God will never put his hand on your back and push you, never. He'll put his hand out in front of you and say, son, daughter, will you come home? This morning, the hand of God is in front of you. And he's looking at you, not the person next to you, not the person on your right or your left, he's looking at you. And he's saying, will you come home this morning? Will you surrender your life in exchange, receive all that I have for you? Second group of people. As I was speaking, immediately the Holy Spirit highlighted a situation, a relationship, a moment to you. That was not just some random thought. God wants to deal with it this morning. He does not want you to walk out of here with trauma, pain any longer. The spirit that rose Christ from the dead is in here and is waiting for you to be set free. And here's what's incredible about the Bible. God says all you have to do is one thing to receive everything I've talked about today, faith. You don't need a feeling. You don't need to understand it all. You don't have to have the best background. You don't have to have the best bank account. You don't have to have the best anything. But if you have faith that God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do, you will receive every promise as yes and amen. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm not gonna hype this moment up. I, I can get hype and I'm not against it, but just I'm not feeling that today. If you're in that first group and you're just like Ross, but more importantly, you're like, God, I don't wanna live for myself anymore. Living for myself has left me in depression. Living for myself has led me into darkness. Living for myself has led me into the world. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. If you are tired of living that way that the world has told you is right, this is your moment this morning. Or if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, come forward. So I'm just going to ask you right now, come forward. Whoever that is, step out of your seat, be bold, make a decision. It just takes one person to be bold. Proud of you. Come on, bro. Come on. This is powerful. Come on. I see you. I see you. Come on. Come on. Come on, bro. I'll pray for you in a sec, all right? Come on. This is powerful. Come on. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming, keep coming. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. Come on, come on. Proud of you guys. Proud. Come on. We're going to wait a sec. If you're coming up here, just close your eyes for a sec. I'm not going to do anything weird, I promise. There's at least five more people. You need to come forward right now. You're feeling your chest pounding. It's not because I'm a good preacher. It's the Spirit of God drawing you in. I'm going to wait a few more seconds. Just come up real quick. Who else? Come on, proud of you guys. That's awesome. That's awesome. Come on. Proud of you. Proud of you. Come on, this is incredible. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Last call. Is there anybody else this morning? Don't miss your moment with God. It's not too late. He's not mad. We're not going to judge you. Just come up real quick. Sometimes there's things in the spirit where you got to move fast. Just move real quick. Come on, proud of you guys. This is awesome. Come on, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome, awesome. Hey, all you guys that came forward, just look at me for a sec. I'm not trying to be weird. <laughs> I just want to look at you because you're making the best decision of your life. And li listen, your life will not be the same. 
What I said from this mic is not good talk. It's the power of God. And what's about to happen in your life right now is you'll never be the same. The Bible says when you give your life to Jesus, you become born again. All that pain, trauma, old stuff, it's washed away by the blood of Jesus. And now you're going to have a new mind, new thoughts, and your life is going to be greater than it's ever been. In the kingdom of God, we don't go bummer from bummer. <laughs> it doesn't get good right now and gets worse later. You go from glory to glory. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to say a prayer together because the Bible tells us we have the power of life or death in our tongue. So I'm going to lead you through that prayer. You guys ready? Now listen, you don't have to shout this. If you want to shout it out loud, I'm not going to stop you. But just say this out loud and mean it. Think, of you, think as if Jesus is standing in front of you. You're speaking to him. Church, can we join our brothers and sisters in this prayer? Let's just say this. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I believe you are the son of God. You died on a cross and shed your blood for me. I repent and I turn from all my sin. From this day forward, I make you my Lord. Say these last few things. Say, Jesus, I receive you into my heart and I make you my Lord. Last thing, say, Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, fill me now. Say it again. Fill me now. Fill me with power. In the name of Jesus. Can we have some of our ministry team just pray and lay hands on them? But we have another group of people while they're doing that. Just stay up here. We have some of the amazing church leaders who are going to pray for you. As I was sharing tonight or this morning, if you started thinking of situations that you want healing and freedom from, just come up right now. I'm not going to hype that up either. If there's marriages, relationships, things that have happened in business, betrayal, suffering, grief, loneliness, all those things, just come forward right now because Jesus is going to set you free. I saw it last service and I already see it happening again. That's the anointing of God right there. So keep coming, come forward. If you're up here in the front, come as far forward as you can so we have more room. Keep coming, keep coming. This is incredible. If you're coming forward to receive healing, lift your hand so I can see you. I want to pray for you. Just lift your hand. Okay, awesome. Keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands if you're coming up for healing. Father, we declare right now in the name of Jesus, there it is right there. That's the spirit of God right there. He is setting you free from trauma, from pain, from brokenness, from anger, from unforgiveness. We say in the name of Jesus, be free. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And I declare from the top of your head to the soles of your feet that the spirit of God will touch you right now. Every word that was spoken over you that was not from the Spirit of God, I break its power right now. Every broken relationship, every bit of betrayal, be gone. A little bit more, a little bit more. Stay with me. Come on, stay with me. We're building endurance in the presence of God. Yeah, that's the presence of God right there. Some of you guys, you need to close your eyes so you can focus. Let the Lord touch you right now. Right now it's at knee deep. He wants to go to waist deep. He wants to go from waist deep to chest deep. Holy Spirit, immerse and submerge your people right now. Yeah, I see the Lord. He's unwinding and untangling thoughts that have come up from situations of trauma. You will no longer think like that. You will no longer, no longer see like that. Because who the sun sets free is free indeed. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. A little bit longer. Just stay with me a little bit longer. If there is somebody that has betrayed you or hurt you, you have to do this one thing. I've seen the Lord set so many people free from this. Say their name out loud and just say, I forgive you. I release you. You no longer have a hold on me. You don't have to shout their name, but just say it. Release them. Release them from the pain. Release them from what they've done, what they've spoken. Come, Holy Spirit, more, 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 more. Just wait with me a little bit longer. Come on, God's really touching people. This is special. If you're not up here, would you extend your arms? Come on. How would you pray if this was your brother? How would you pray if this was your mom, your aunt? You'd be a little bit louder than that. 
Come on, lift your voice. This is breakthrough right now. This is healing right now. Come on, years of trauma being gone in a moment. This is the God of miracles. This is the God of breakthrough. This is the God who in a moment and in an instant shifts and changes it all around. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you even more than this, God. Release your glory. Release your glory, God. There's more, we're at 80%, we're at 80%, there's more, press in. If this is new for you, it's okay, just let God minister to you, just let him touch you. Let that heart healing start from your mind. Let it go to your heart, let it touch your body. Yeah, right there, keep going, fill, fill, fill. We release the shalom of God right now, the peace of God. Every tormenting spirit broken by the blood of the Lamb. Any physical pain or disease or sickness that was caused by trauma, I curse you right now. And I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. Every bit of depression and anxiety and cancer, diabetes, every issue of the body be broken now. We say by the anointing of God, every yoke is broken. Not some, not a few, every yoke broken now. If you have sickness in your body, lift your hand right now. If you have disease or pain, just lift your hand so I can see you. Father, I declare right now, be healed. We release the healing power of God right now. In the name of Jesus, right now. Every organ be restored, bloodstream be restored, lungs be restored. Every tendon, joint, and ligament be healed by the power of God right now. Is there anybody in here that's had trouble breathing recently? You have to lift your hand so I can see you. Anybody that's had trouble breathing, come up right here. I want to pray for you. I can't see everybody. If you've had trouble breathing, just come forward right here. Awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Just come forward real quick. Yeah, I want to pray for you guys. Awesome, awesome. Father, we declare in the name of Jesus, healing. 